start first from my right uh, i have uh, here with me uh, amit mehta who i have known for a long time now and he's a very very specialist equity player so i would say if amit you can introduce yourself make a few uh, brief opening remarks and then we'll take it forward sure thanks anjeev uh, so i'm amit mehta i work at a firm called greenstone advisors we are actually a boutique investment bank that is focused exclusively on the renewable energy space so our key focus over the last 3 to 4 years since we've been operating is only capital raising and m&a that's primarily on the renewable energy space and primarily focused on the utility scale section so that's that's kind of way where we have started so obviously we have been operating since 2015 and seen the sector move from where it was more of you know a sector where people would just want to invest some capital to see how it is to now becoming a pure business type of sector so if we see how it has evolved over the last 3 years yeah from say a capex of 6 7 crores a megawatt to what people are predicting to 3 4 crores a megawatt and tariffs from like 6 7 rupees to 3 rupees and that shift has happened due to multiple reasons few being discussed by mr sanjeev and danish earlier that how the cost of capital has reduced how a lot of players have come into the sector starting off with minority private equity players moving on to private equity players backing platforms by themselves and now being talks considered about more pension funds sovereign funds etc coming into the sector so even that shift uh, even on the technology side as well as the type of capital has changed uh, i would like to touch upon two points uh, in the opening remarks one would be on say returns which danish earlier mentioned that you know they've compressed from that 16 17% to 13 14% uh, we agree that we have seen such type of compression in the market however people you know predicting that are these lower tariffs viable or unviable obviously it's a question mark think being a third party okay we have all the right to comment whether it's viable or unviable but if you look at the people who are bidding these auctions right or take winning the auctions in this these are people who have developed over gigawatt of projects like 500 megawatt gigawatt couple of gigawatts so saying that they do not know what's happening what is their cost of capital or what is their capital cost because that is another plug into this big kind of game of let's say cost of capital and capital cost so there are players who are i would say uh strong enough and who are educated enough to know what they are bidding so having being you know saying that is it viable and viable that is okay it's very easy we agree it's very difficult to absorb saying that oh, is it to an half rupee uh, tariff viable for a 15% return but having said that we need to back the players who are actually bidding this and who are smart enough to know what they are bidding at so giving them that benefit of doubt that over the next couple of years these projects will be built up and we'll have a better sector to look into and the second point that i would like to mention is on the mna front given that a lot of equity aspect is covered by danish and mr sanjeev would be that yes that significant amount of consolidation he is being seen in the sector so somebody with a 5000 megawatts having no capital to bid in uh, is definitely looking out for mna opportunities and there are players who are actually planning to become large utilities as we saw in the us right it started off with multiple players and at the end we are now narrowed down to five to seven utilities who are key in the renewable energy sector so same we are on that path in india and on that mna front maybe just for you know what we are seeing in the market we can let you all know is that okay the same 14 to 15% returns is what the acquirers are hoping for but then there is one element which is the debt element what any acquirer has so what we see that this 14 15% is around the 9% refinancing type of numbers what we see in the market that people are baking in while they give out their acquisition quotes uh but having said that every developer has his own view and every investor has his own view and on the ebitda ranges if you would just like to say then around the 6.75 to 7 times ebitda for any operating project is where we are seeing the market today in the mna front and there are significant amount of players few of them mentioned by danish earlier who have acquired significant stakes in the last 6 months and we see them as one of the large players going ahead and uh, that that's how the sector is moving into that yes we will see larger players evolving and over the next 6 to 12 months we see a lot of mna activity that is going to happen in the sector that's where we would put it thank you great i think so great opening remarks specifically on equity side so we have also with us uh, uh, mr rubi oja environment and social development specialist from ifc i would want that if she can add her international perspective and a little bit about herself also so that we know you better thanks sanjeev my name is ruby oja and i work with the international finance corporation 
I actually have a slightly different uh, background from the rest of my panelists uh, in the sense that I am not a finance specialist. I come from an environmental and social background and I've been working in this line for the last 18 years. Uh, so I also have a small presentation in which I will be presenting on the key environmental and social challenges that we face in uh, so solar projects. Although we all know that the renewable sector is a cleaner uh, option as compared to conventional power. But still, uh, I would be touching upon some of the ENS risk. And we heard in the previous session, uh, which was on the developer's perspective, on the kind of challenges they faced. And one of the panelists also spoke of land acquisition as a key challenge. So um, I would be talking about all those issues. And I will also talk about the IFC's perspective. When IFC is investing in such projects, then what is the ENS standard that IFC follows and what are the various guidelines? So. Um, with that, I think uh, I'll talk more about that in the, my presentation. Thanks. Thank you. So I think we'll need to keep a little time for your presentation as well. And uh, now let me uh, bring in, uh, as uh, I think uh, you would like to listen to somebody who's very, very really on the ground in terms of almost all the projects that are happening. So a rating agency, which is uh, headed by uh, Sabya Sashi here, who's present with us from Ikra. Sabya, can you give us some <coughs> views from the <coughs> sorry grassroots and how things are shaping up in this sector and what your views are specifically for uh, some of the developers who are present here, how they should handle equity and take it forward? Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks Sanjeev. Uh, let me introduce myself first. I am Sabya Sashi Majumdar. Uh, I am Senior Vice President with Ikra Limited. I am part of the ratings business of Ikra Limited. Uh, I look after power and a few other sectors such as telecom, cement, etc. And uh, we are a 50% plus owned by Moody's and we are a listed company. So that's a little bit about myself and my organization. Uh, uh, coming to our, uh, see, there are two questions typically which I'm always asked whenever I'm speaking on the renewable energy, whether it's solar or wind. Uh, one is, of course, whether the government's target of 150 gigawatt or whatever, 175 gigawatt is going to be achieved or not. And second, of course, is increasingly on the viability of the tariffs. Uh, so to answer that first question, my always my answer is that as a rating agency, we are not really uh, so concerned about whether we are going to do 175 gigawatt or 100 gigawatt or 50 gigawatt. Uh, our concern as a rating agency is that whatever gigawatts we add, whether it's through rooftop or grid connected solar or grid connected wind, uh, as far as possible, it should be viable. I mean, they should be uh, such that they make money for the bankers as well as for the investors. Even if it is only five gigawatts or 10 gigawatts per annum, we're not really so much concerned about that. Uh, second, coming to tariff viability, now obviously we have seen both in the case of solar and wind we are seeing that it's coming down to 2 rupees 65 paise or thereabouts 65 for wind some 250 so 24 for solar now of course those are projects which are not implemented yet those are projects which are going to be implemented in the future so we can always make certain normative assumptions about those like what are the capex per megawatt that you are assuming, what is the cost of debt, what is the tenure of debt, uh, what is the kind of PLF. For example, in wind, we saw earlier that it was unusual to have more than 25% PLF, but now with the latest generation machines, we are seeing that people are talking even about 40% in certain locations. Similarly, in solar, we are seeing that because of, you know, by having the appropriate ACDC ratio, you can still have that with trackers and all we can have mid 20 percent also so we make certain normative assumption about what plfs could be achieved what could be the likely cost per megawatt and what would be uh, you know likely tenure of debt cost of debt etc now our indications to the i mean based on what we understand based about these various norms we are seeing that the dscrs for such projects are typically in the 1.1 to 1.2 range so maybe from a uh, banker's perspective, they are still very lendable projects. 
Now our equity return computation typically for such projects are coming into the single, high single digits. Now the question is, is that good enough? I mean, typically, the since I have been associated with the Indian power sector, that 15.5 percent or 16 percent, you know, post-tax return on equity is always firmly imprinted in our mind. But that was based on certain, uh, you know, uh, investment. Uh, that was based on certain return expectations. Now, if you are, for example, a Japanese guy who probably has to pay his bank to keep his money, would he be insisting upon a 16.5% return? Assuming that in over a 25-year period, the rupee does not depreciate by more than 3%. Perhaps for a even 5-6% rupee ROE could be good enough. So really as a debt rating agency, as long as you know the DSCR is safely above one, we are not so concerned. We are not really so much concerned about equity returns. And again, it's a question of who is the guy who is investing the money, what is his return expectation? And what is the alternate return he could get on that money? So those are questions which really the specialists, I mean, the guys who are actually putting in the money. I mean, for me to hazard a particular number of you as a, you know, arranger to hazard for that number is one thing, but it's actually ultimately down to the person who has to put in the money. So broadly, that's what I'd like to add. Of course, as and when we are just, uh, you know, discussing risks, I could give my own perspective about what we see as a key risk. Uh, I think you rightly said that you cannot, of course, get into the territory of what the return on equity should be and could be. But uh, I would like to add here that, you know, whatever I am hearing on the ground from the investors, that single digit return is actually not really something which they are as attracted towards. And, uh, you know, though. Uh, it has to rationalize, of course, from a level of 16% uh, that government first started with on the post-tax, which you rightly referred to. But then the semblance is that nobody expects it uh, at that low level also. But I think we'll continue to discuss that as we go along, which is a critical agenda. But uh, then I would now, like uh, Mukan, who's here present with us, uh, if he can give a little perspective and also introduce about himself. And then we'll take it uh, forward with a little more detailed analysis. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Sanjeev. Um, I'm Mukund Santanam, part of the corporate finance team based in Deutsche Bank. Um, interestingly, Deutsche Bank, of course, being a bank, we're mainly in the debt space. Uh, again, being an international bank, we clearly look at more cross-border financing. Uh, but for Deutsche Bank, this particular sector, the renewable sector, has been a very important part of our home market. In Germany, which as you know is pretty much a leader, whether it comes to technology, whether it comes to uh, the regulatory environment, whether it comes to financing structures, uh, in terms of renewables and how renewables have evolved out there, um, obviously we have done a lot across for the renewable sector in Germany, in the US, and recently in the recent past in India. Our interest in this sector is across a range of uh, products. Right? One is clearly as a debt financer. Um, debt financer, project finance, yes, but more interestingly as a more whole co level financing, which is looking at refinancing of existing indebtedness. The second interest that we have is essentially as a equity capital markets. Uh, we, we are there with quite a few clients and helping them introduce them to the uh, public markets, both in India and outside. Uh, the third, of course, is, um, you know, getting our international clients to the Indian market uh, and essentially working on you know, having various clients so looking for uh, looking for opportunities, investment opportunities in India, and our Indian clients are looking at uh, international capital uh, capital kind of flow in there. So that's broadly the kind of role that we're working on. Uh, I know we're going to be discussing a few things around uh, you know so some of the key topics, but I'll just kind of take on one two points that Danish also mentioned. Um, essentially, we you know we're seeing a lot of private equity investors coming into India. Uh, they are coming in mainly as investors who see value in building and developing a platform. So you see them come in, put in a platform, bid for contracts at primary, develop those contracts, and then later obviously like any private equity investor, investor will look at an exit option. So that is a model, and you're seeing the first of those actually probably going towards the exit door now. The second model that we're seeing interestingly is quite a few other both private equity as well as more what we call more patient capital, uh, you know, longer term capital, 
looking at not I won't say minority stakes, looking at 50% kind of stakes in large platforms in India or to be built platforms in India. Where does that interest really come from? You know, they don't want to go through the um, the the difficulties in dealing with a single uh, single promoter in India. They don't want to go through the challenge of building a platform from scratch. Uh, but on the other hand, there are existing utilities, both multinational and Indian utilities, uh, that are already either having plans of building a platform in India or already have a platform. And there's a lot of private equity interest in actually being a participant in that. So you'll see quite a lot of divestments from some have already been reported in the paper, some are yet to be ha yet to happen. But divestments from large international utility players and even the local players to bring in a financial investor as a partner in the doing the growth process. It's also driven for many international uh, utility players like the European players. They don't like, uh, you know, they're having a lot of stress on their balance sheets globally. Uh, rating agencies obviously keep a watch on the total debt that they have. The moment they get at a 50% or below level, uh, and the moment they kind of have the Indian entity as not a controlling or fully integrated entity, they can in effect uh, not include the debt within the overall debt. So 50% is a kind of sweet spot where you still are able to have a JV, you still are able to control it, the financial uh, partners also interested, and best of all, the debt doesn't consolidate back on the balance sheet. So we're seeing a lot of that, we'll see a lot of that happening in the next six months, one year. Um, other thing that we touch upon, the various exit options, right? What is the way in which the renewable market can raise capital in India? Uh, fact is renewables are one of the most capital intensive, right? The, the cost of cost of production is negligible, or almost zero except for minimal o &M cost. It's all capital that goes in upfront and you get returns across the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Very classical financing problem. So obviously the solution is also very classical financing solutions. Um, and you know, we have looked at the equity markets, we looked at the debt markets. In fact, we looked at debt as a way of replacing equity also. I'll probably kind of touch on that. No, definitely. I agree with you. Debt here, definitely. Uh, and specifically, these innovative structures do offer a lot of opportunity to the current set of developers to actually go out there and, you know, raise almost equity, quasi equity in a very, very innovative manner. And I think that definitely needs uh, deliberation. So I agree with you there. And I think we, we will continue to do that. So I'm sure if you have formed some very pressing questions, We'll take first them. Otherwise, I would probably start with uh, Ms. Oja to actually make a presentation of her. And then we have some small, small presentations to make. And in the meanwhile, you can you know, think through all your pressing questions and we'll take it forward. So if there is any uh, question that has emerged already and you want it to be directed to a particular uh, speaker, please feel free and we'll deliberate it right now. In the meanwhile, I would request if you can get ready with your presentation, Ms. Oja. So, if there's nothing uh, very pressing right now, I'll request her to make a presentation. Please, can you make your presentation first? Thanks, Sanjeev. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm going to talk about the ENS risk in a solar project and uh, what is IFC's perspective uh, when investing in such projects. So IFC has invested in a number of uh, renewable energy sector like in solar or in wind. Uh, but IFC has its own environmental and social performance standards and there's a team of ENS people uh, in-house who look at such investments and what is the approach we follow. Uh, so, so, I mean, just uh, talking of solar energy, the very first thought that comes to our mind when we uh, speak of solar energy is that it is certainly much more environmental friendly than other conventional power sources in the sense that there are no um, emissions from a project like in case of a conventional th thermal power project or there are no uh, wastewater discharge or the carbon footprint is certainly much, much lower than uh, as compared to another any other power source. Uh, but having said that, uh, in a, I mean, I've worked on a number of solar projects, so there I would be just touching upon the key ENS issues. The first and the fo foremost is the land acquisition. We heard about that in the developer session as well. Uh, so as we all know that land is a very contentious issue and uh, it's not freely available. So to get a land which is free from encumbrance, it's itself a very big challenge. And what we encounter in India is that uh, 
a single part to get a vacant land in itself is very difficult so um, there would i mean either the land acquisition would involve physical displacement of people wherein people are residing and are required to be moved away or there would be economic displacement economic displacement means that people are practicing farming or some sort of or the cat there's a grazing area so those people have to be moved away from that and that is called economic displacement and then also there are issues related to uh, land ownership land ownership records are not as sorted out in india as in other countries so there are number of title holders so to get all that sorted by a developer uh, is a big challenge then uh, for a solar project apart from the land acquisition for the main plant there would also be a transmission line and other associated facilities uh, so acquiring the right of way for that is also a challenge and um, when we look at solar project and compare it with other uh, pro, um, conventional power sources the land required is certainly much more than uh, so on an average it's like 4 to 6 acres per megawatt for a solar while it would be 1 um, acre for a thermal power plant so the land requirement is certainly more the other risk is that of cumulative risk when i say cumulative risk it means that suppose an area has been suppose a location has been identified which has a great solar potential so it means that there'll be number of solar projects coming up in that area so that that is called cumulative impacts when in a in a certain area there are number of projects coming up so that would uh, i mean that would certainly be a multiplier effect on the various uh, um, impacts that we talk of like economic displacement or livelihood loss or uh, community health and safety or labor's accommodation so many um, trucks moving in with the raw material and the construction workers so when there are number of such projects then it becomes a multiplier effect uh, third is of course the construction and the contractor management um, although this is a smaller scale as compared to other kind of projects if we look at but um, there are three key issues i mean which we can broadly highlight here one is on the labor and the working conditions we often see that the uh, i mean we see when i review the projects solar projects i see issues on the working hours of labor the hygiene and the drinking water requirements for labor then the ohs issues uh, because the workers are getting exp working at high they getting uh, working on electrical things they are also handling broken so broken solar panels and third the most important is the labor accommodation we often pay not much attention to the labor accommodation and i've seen that workers would be residing within the solar farm itself with very poor living conditions so when ifc is investing i mean ifc actually i when i at the um, towards the end of my presentation i'll also talk about the ifc standards and there's one on uh, which is called ps2 on labor and working conditions and there are guidelines on how the what should be the minimum basic facilities that should be provided in a labor accommodation uh lastly on the water availability um, they i mean the water is required for a solar project at two phases one of course is the construction phase and during the operation phase the water is required for cleaning of the panels now if i just look at a thumb rule uh, it's around 7000 to 10000 liters per megawatt for cleaning the panels uh, i mean depending on the location the frequency of cleaning of course will vary but then again i mean uh, if there are number of projects and it's a big capacity solar project then availability of water also is a challenge now some of the key questions that we often encounter is on the in india uh, in the regulatory regime there is no requirement of carrying out an environmental uh, assessment for a solar project solar projects are exempted uh, but when when ifc is investing in solar projects ifc does ask for an environmental and social impact assessment now uh, in many of the projects that we work on we often see that the the solar project is coming up on a government land which means the land is being provided by government so in that case the land acquisition becomes the responsibility of the government and while the developer is just doing the other things so in that case what we ideally foresee is that the government should do the social impact assessment while the developer should do, do the environmental impact assessment and the tender documents uh, which are which are given to the concessioner should include those requirements that the environmental management plan or what should be developed uh, by the developer again the cumulative assessments and uh, the implementation part of it i mean as i said that there is an overlap between the role of a government and the developer in the in the case where the government is providing the land uh, yeah so i mean uh, i mean basically we're looking at many projects we just come across what should be a best uh, risk allocation strategy because that is what has to be agreed upon 
So as I said that if the land is being provided by government and this is a scenario in which we are looking where the land is government. So the government, it becomes government's responsibility to provide land free from encumbrances uh, to carry out the social impact assessment while the developer should be responsible for developing the environmental impact assessment, the environmental management plan and uh, developing the other various sub-management plans like occupational health and safety management plan or developing a stakeholder engagement. And then there should be a joint responsibility between the government and the developer, uh, like uh, like including what should be the contract, but the government should include the various uh, ENS clauses in the concessional agreement so that the developer can further implement it through its uh, contractors. Uh, now, I mean, why we are saying all those things is because, I mean, uh, I come from IFC and IFC has its own sustainability framework which includes eight performance standards. Now what are performance standards? So these are kind of, uh, I'll just touch upon that. The, uh, the performance standards are listed as between PS1 to 8. PS1 is assessment and management of environmental and social risks and uh, issues, impacts. So uh, it basically includes uh, details on what should be the in the policy what should be the organizational capacity what are the various management programs what are the measures to assess the environmental and social risks in a project ps2 is labor and working conditions so it touches upon the grievance mechanism that should be there for the workers what should be the working conditions and what should be the occupational health and safety standards uh, PS3 is on pollution prevention and resource efficiency, which touches upon um, things that are either released to the environment like emissions or wastewater discharge or solid and hazardous waste, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, PS4 is community health and safety, so it touches upon, uh, so if there is some transport of material and which is passing through um, some village or through a road which might uh, impact the community, so it touches upon that. These are very detailed standards, but I'm just, I mean, talking very roughly because we have limited time. PS5 is on land acquisition and involuntary resettlement. I already talked about that in my first slide. PS6 is biodiversity conservation. So it is like if uh, the project is coming up in a forest area where there is a uh, population of flora and fauna, so uh, what to look into that. PS7 is indigenous people. It means uh, indigenous people, I mean, what we call scheduled tribes in India. Uh, so these are the people... Uh, who are not uh, who are not into the mainstream population and uh, so i mean we have to look into how they are getting impacted and how they are getting compensated for that ps8 is cultural heritage and uh, it would uh, it's basically like if there is a site of uh, archaeological importance or of cultural importance so if that is falling within a project area then how do we handle that so so i mean these are broad eight standards but depending on the project depending on its location so we evaluate which of these eight would be uh, applicable to a project and then what should be the requirement from the point uh, when we are doing an assessment from the ens side yeah thank you <clears throat> thank you rubies so I think that was a great perspective. I do have a question of my own, but I'll keep it till the end because uh, what you rightly brought out that, you know, I have seen, I have seen uh, while I was uh, with uh, one of the advisor to one of the companies of government of Gujarat also, where you invested in Gujarat State Petronet Limited. I do recall that you have a great uh, perspective on uh, environment and the safety and uh, the social development around that. And I think uh, we all get, uh, uh, you know, well, uh, I would say, well developed and uh, more, I would say, conscious towards our environment with your help. So I think uh, one more round of applause so that you all get woken up and she gets very encouraged and enthused to take it forward as an agenda. Thank you for that. So what I'll do is I'll make a small presentation then. I have uh, kept some small, brief few points for this deliberation. I'll discuss that with you and then we'll take forward with a more detailed analysis on risk by Sabhisashi and uh, some key insights that Mukund had shared and equity uh, interventions which Amit has uh, already lined up for you. So I'll take a small brief moment and make this presentation.